Welcome back to the show. Uh, today, Jim and I are going to sit and talk about VHFs, why they're important, how to choose which VHF is proper for your boat, and a couple of the features that each of these VHFs offer. So just about every order that we send out of here includes a VHF radio. Any new package, any new motor, um, that's one of the questions that always comes up. Yes. Do I need a VHF? What kind of VHF? How do you handle that? So the first few things that I always look and I ask the customer is, what is your primary boating use? Are you cruising? Are you using this for offshore navigation? Are you just inshore locally? Because there are fixed mount VHFs and then there's also a handheld VHF, which Handheld is very easy to grab, throw in your ditch bag, and you have it for emergency purposes. If you're going to be more inshore, coastal, you know your area, and you don't feel like you need to have a high-end VHF fixed mounted on the boat. The second thing I always ask is, do you want this VHF to connect to your chart plotter? So a lot of the VHFs can connect via NEMA 2000 or NEMA 0183 to the chart plotter, and there are some that don't connect at all. They're completely standalone. So I always ask if they want to connect to NEMA, then we have plenty of options that'll do that. The next is integrated GPS. So if you are getting a VHF that's not gonna to connect to the plotter, it most likely has the integrated GPS for your position located inside of the handheld or the fixed mount. Then there's options that do not have the integrated GPS, which will require you to connect to NEMA 2000 or NEMA 0183 to establish that GPS connection. The next question I ask is, do you want AIS? So there are VHFs that will allow you to receive AIS data, and there's also VHFs that will allow you to receive and transceive AIS data. The next question I ask is, is this gonna be a single station VHF or are you gonna have multi stations? So there's VHFs that will allow you to have multiple mics you can hook up. There's wireless mics that you can connect to a VHF. And then there's just a standalone VHF, one mic only, no more connections, no wireless connections. Um, then there's a couple minor features, whether you want the hailer horn, whether you want the fog feature, um, uh, external speaker mic options available. So there's a couple different fine-tuned options, but those are the main attributes that I'm looking for. My head is spinning. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. So most people just need a VHF that they can just call the fuel dock with, right? Yeah. So what is a basic VHF? Basic VHF. Um, we have a couple of different models. I would say like the ICOM M330. That's a basic VHF that anybody can pretty much plug and play. Into so the M330, system. so it's got the wired mic. Wired mic. The speakers in the unit Speaker. itself. Uh, it's, uh, what else? No NEMA 2000 connection. It does, does NEMA have, 183? does have NEMA 0183 and it does have the integrated GPS. So that's a great starting option if you just need a VHF on the boat. So you brought up so much to talk about. Yes. Let's just start with the integrated GPS. Integrated GPS. Yeah. So uh, most people, when they install a VHF radio, neglect to connect it to a GPS, but you have to have the GPS data for the MMSI DSC feature calling. Work. Yeah, yes. DSC if calling you're connecting, work. yes. It's also a backup source, so I always recommend for people to get the VHF with the integrated GPS, yeah. because if your plotter goes out, you still have your position right. on that VHF. Yeah. So it's a backup source of GPS, but also I like that feature that it just automatically has DSC working without being connected to anything else. Yes. Because nobody ever connects it. Which brings up another topic of MMSI. MMSI. Nobody ever gets their MMSI number. No one gets the MMSI. It's very simple to sign up and register for your MMSI number. Go to BoatUS.com and you can sign up. I think it's probably around 25, 30 bucks now. Yeah. They usually get it to you the same day. That's your eight digit MMSI number. Yeah, it's a code that goes into your VHF, so when you hit that DSC button, it uh, sends out that you're in distress, but lets everybody know who you are. Who so, you are, what kind of vessel you are yeah. in, the boat length, there's many different settings that you can set up with the MMSI number. Yeah, so handheld versus fixed mount. Why would you get a handheld, why would you get a fixed mount? I think the handheld option is great for someone who doesn't necessarily want to install a VHF, but wants that safety feature of being able to call out if they are in distress. Yeah. Um, and as you know, like PHF is not a requirement for voting. So some people just think that it's easiest to have a handheld. So what I've always found is that whenever you go to grab that handheld VHF, it's dead. Yeah. So that's why I think that a boat should have a 
fixed mount VHF at a minimum, which is connected to your 12 volt system on both, and then you can always have VHF. Well, along with VHF then, so if you get a handheld, it obviously has its own antenna. Mm -hmm. If you get a fixed mount, now you're adding that necessary yeah. VHF antenna that has to be installed separately. It's a lot more complexity, a lot more expense, but it'll always be there to work. Always. Because, you know, the analogy I always give is when you're sinking or something's happening and there's a boat 100 yards away, you don't know their phone number to call. No. But you can probably get them on the VHF. Right. So it's good to have the VHF. Yes. A working VHF. Um, you mentioned handhelds, again. That you know, the popularity of handhelds. So some handhelds are able to use alkaline batteries. Yes. And they have an optional alkaline battery tree you can buy for them. So that's what I always recommend, is if you're gonna get a handheld, at least get one with the alkaline battery tray as an option. Yes. So you can always have some spare Back batteries up. on board because they are guaranteed to be always good. Yeah, and even if you have a fixed mount VHF, it's not a bad <laughs> idea to also have a handheld in your ditch bag. So if you if something does happen, you've got to jump ship, grab your ditch bag, you do have the handheld VHF still. Yeah. One feature that I've seen in a lot of the, the higher end VHFs is the speaker that's actually in the mic. Yes. So when you're running in the boat at like 35 knots, it's windy, it's loud, and you actually want to stay in a conversation, you can put that right to your ear and hear what's going on. So I think that's a really nice. Noise feature. canceling. But not many have that. Not many. Yeah. So that's, that's the feature I always look for. So NEMA 0183 and 3 in 2000. 0183 has been around forever, yes. and that's where you just have the wires coming out the back of the radio. And NEMA 2000 is the more modern one that has a cable with a plug that you plug into a T. Yes. Onto a, into a NEMA 2000 network on your boat. Yeah. So it's just a plug and play solution. Yep. Uh, NEMA 0183 is a lot more complex, but once it's connected, it works and it's fun. Yes. Uh, do all radios have NEMA 2000 now? No, not all radios do have NEMA 2000, and they are pretty good at specifying in the title whether it is NEMA 2000 capable or not, yeah. which is important to look at. Because some features, it could just be a single digit that changes whether it is NEMA 2000 compatible or not. But forever, all radios that had DSC had NEMA 183. So do they still all have NEMA 183? Yes. They do? Okay. So that hasn't gone away at all? No. Okay. We can talk about remote things. Yeah. Let's talk remote things. So remote mics, that's where you can have your VHF fixed mounted somewhere. Yes. And then you can have a really long cable mm -hmm. to have another mic come out somewhere else in the boat. So maybe you have your VHF on the upper helm and you want to have a bat or a secondary station for it at your lower helm. Yes. So you get a remote mic. Remote mic repeats all of the data that's important on the screen. Most of them have an LCD display on the front. It's either an orange or white. Um, they're within whatever is at the other station, VHF, and just view that data wirelessly, make call outs, you can still do your same distress signal, they have a button on the side to send out your okay. DSC call. Very popular. Um, we do have situations where people want to fix mount VHFs, they don't want to rely on the hand mic. The fishermen love that. Yes. Because they'll put one on one frequency and one on another frequency. On another. So, you have yeah. two different channels, you can monitor different things and not have to worry about any interference. Or... And it's good for redundancy. It is, yes. And that also leads you to like a black box VHF where you have a black box mounted behind the dash and you can hook up to some of them, you can put up to four mics. Okay. So you could have wired for mics, you could have you know, uh, wireless for mics. mics. Wireless for mics. Wireless. <laughs> wireless for mics and wired for mics. <laughs> you can have wired remotes, wired mics, or wireless mics. Wired mics or wireless mics. There you go. Yes. Remotes. No, remotes. wired remotes Wire and wireless remotes. <laughs> remotes. They all have mics. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Lordy. So how often do we get called about these MMSI numbers and people buy a used boat mm. and they're like, yeah, that's not my MMSI number in there. Can you reprogram it? Yes. What can we do? Every single manufacturer is different with reprogramming the MMSI number. There are some of the VHFs that you can go in and manually reset it on the consumer end. And then there's VHFs where you have to take it to an authorized dealer to get the MMSI number wiped clean so you can reinsert your new MMSI number. Do you have to send some back to the manufacturer? Some, sometimes they do have to go back to the manufacturer, yes. If there's, if it's an older model or if they don't make a reprogramming tool anymore, then it has to go back directly to the manufacturer. Yeah. Is there a charge for that normally? Sometimes, yeah. It varies based off the manufacturer, but it is very important that you do not keep that VHF with the old MMSI number in it. Because if you ever need it, yeah, if you ever need to use that DSC button, it's gonna 
they're going to call the information from that MMSI For a different number vessel. to somebody else and they're going to say, yeah, I'm fine. I'm sitting here on my couch. Yes. Meanwhile, you're drowning on the boat. Based on your travel requirements, if you're traveling out of the country, you would have to go through FCC to get a different MMSI number. It just has different um, requirements that you have to fill out if you're going overseas or out of the country. So you cannot just use your standard MMSI number. So it's like an international MMSI international, number? Yep. You have to get registered for that and then you have to get the radio reprogrammed. Yes. And then once you come back in the U.S., can you keep You can using? still use the same okay. MMSI number. It's, so, it's used in for inside the United States and outside. So if you know you're going abroad with your boat, you should get the international one. Right yes. Away. Yep. Got it. So you mentioned some VHFs have AIS built in. So instead of a standalone box, it's actually built right into the VHF? Yes. Okay. So AIS is the automatic identification system that is used with your MMSI number on your vessel. And there are VHFs that have the ability to receive AIS data, which means your personal information will not be transmitted out to other vessels, but you will be able to receive vessel data from someone who is transmitting. And what vessel data you get would be, you can get the boat speed, the vessel name, you can get the dimensions of the boat, and in case you do need to make a DSC call, the person that is transmitting their AIS data, the Coast Guard or authorities will be able to see where that vessel is because it does have exact real-time positioning. Okay, so you can get either a transponder or just a receiver? Yeah, so like this, there's a standard Horizon GX2400, that's a fixed mount VHF, and it does have integrated AIS receiver built in. And then on the other hand, you have the Vesper Cortex by Garmin, that is able to receive and transmit your AIS signal. And okay. most of these VHFs, when they do that, it does have a silent option for the AIS, so if you don't want to transmit, you can turn silent mode on, and you will still receive the information from other boats, but it will not transmit your data out. Is there any downside to getting the AIS built into your VHF as opposed to getting a standalone AIS? Um, I mean, there's kind of, it kind of goes back and forth as far as like if you're splitting that power for a VHF antenna with AIS and your VHF, are you kind of killing that signal? Or if you have a dedicated black box that you have a separate VHF antenna and a separate AIS antenna, you're getting the direct feed from both antennas for a you know, more solid signal. Yeah, I get you. I think it just depends on use and range and how solid you need that connection to be for AIS. Okay, so a commercial application for sure should probably have, have a, a separate, standalone AIS. I would have a standard AIS, a separate antenna for AIS, separate antenna for VHF, some of the black boxes do have an AIS VHF splitter built in. Okay. So the Garmin AIS 800, uh, that black box AIS receiver transmitter has an integrated VHF splitter. So you could use a single antenna, split the connection, and have VHF and AIS. I personally don't re recommend that. I would much rather prefer to have separate antennas for both. Thank you guys for watching today. We hope you learned something. Please subscribe to our channel and share with your friends. The subscribe button's right there, and the share button's right down there with it somewhere. How's that? Perfect. Great. <laughs>